Here with this week's hottest stories in the investment world, this is Zach's Friday Finish Line. Hello, and thanks for joining in to this special edition of the Zach's Friday Finish Line. Today, we're going to be speaking with Phil Bach, the CEO of ACSI Funds and Exponential ETFs, and a widely regarded expert in the management, development, and trading of ETFs. Recently, Phil and his team at Exponential launched the Reverse Cap Weighted U.S. ETF, which seeks to weight companies by the inverse of their relative market cap. We take a deep dive into this quote-unquote upside-down fund and together discuss the advantages of utilizing this investment strategy. Check it out. Hey, Phil, welcome back to the show. So to start things off, weighting companies by the inverse of their market cap is like investing from the smallest to the biggest. What are the advantages and disadvantages to this investment strategy? And how does it compare to the to traditional market cap weighting? Well, thank you for having me back on. What we're doing here is we're, we're trying to rethink passive or beta investing. There's the traditional Fama French factor, small minus big. And the idea is that over the long term, small caps will tend to outperform large cap stocks, um, you know, with typically with higher risk and not in all market environments. But small cap stocks do tend to have a better risk return profile. What we're trying to do here is we're, we're taking that, that thesis that small caps will outperform large caps and we're applying it within the S&P 500 or within the large cap space simply by tilting the portfolio back down towards the smaller market cap end of the spectrum. Cool. So if you look at the S&P 500, which your uh, newly launched ETF offers exposure to, Apple is the largest component of the benchmark currently. And by this logic, would Apple be the smallest component of the new fund? And then on top of that, is it difficult or has it been difficult to equate the largest U.S. company by market cap and for a brief moment in time, the country's first $900 billion company? I don't know if they're still at that uh, market cap this morning. Um, Is it hard to equate that with such a small share? Yeah, and that's exactly right. Apple is the, uh, the smallest weight in the reverse cap weight ETF. Apple's a great company. And if you look at the way market cap indexes are constructed, which are the vast majority of the broad index passive you know, index funds out there, is they typically rebalance on a quarterly basis. And every quarter comes, and, and if the stock is appreciated, like Apple has you know, more often than not in recent years, then it gets an increasing weight in the index at every rebalance. So what you have is a system where you're constantly buying high, buying high. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's basically a momentum strategy. But we think that over the long term, it makes more sense to buy low rather than buy high. And so by flipping it over and by putting a higher weight on the companies that are have smaller market capitalizations, then you're essentially doing the opposite. And we see, in fact, a significant value tilt within the reverse cap weight. And, you know, that paired with the bias towards the smaller cap companies within the large cap name, you know, tends to give it a little more performance over time. But, you know, again, you will be missing out on some of the exposure to some of the bigger names. What about other FANG or FAMG? The, sorry, it's kind of insert, an awkward way to insert say. Insert acronym. Yeah. <laughs> insert acronym stock. So Facebook, Amazon, yeah. Microsoft, Netflix, and Google or Alphabet. What are or are there risk in holding heavier positions in such tech stocks? And on the flip side, what are the benefits to holding smaller positions in these tech stocks? So right now, the FANG trade comprises about 17%, including Microsoft, about 17% of the S&P 500. And it's responsible for an outsized proportion of the returns of the S&P, you know, over, over the past year. So it's, that's done well. That's been a great trade. Anyone who's been in that trade has done quite well. Um, reverse is a tool. You can use it alongside cap weighting just to lower your exposure and maybe take some of that FANG money off the, off the table. But also, I think a lot of people have this assumption that, well, I'm in an S&P 500. I'm in a broadly diversified representation of the U.S. market. And the concentration of the S&P 500 is something that a lot of people are not really aware of. I mean, we talked about Apple being the highest weight. The weighting of Apple is, is larger in the S&P 500 than stocks 400 through 500 combined. And what we're seeing now with such a high exposure to the FANG trade, if there are any trust issues or if there are issues that cause that trade to reverse, I think a lot of people are far more exposed than they realize. So we wanted to provide a tool that could be used, you know, that could be used by itself or could be used alongside a market cap weighted exposure to diversify away from some of those risks. 
So kind of shifting gears now to those uh, you know, companies 400 to 500, that area of the S&P 500 is putting small cap companies in the spotlight. And I think from our understanding of your fund, small cap companies are very clearly in the spotlight as these firms would logically make up the biggest components of the fund. However, some of the smallest companies in the S&P 500 have not been the best performers this year. So with that said, do you ever say enough is enough when it comes to an underperforming company? No, this is a this is a rules-based index. We don't make any decisions. We go by, you know, the the S&P 500 index at every rebound and and follow a process, but all these companies just to, you know, these aren't small cap companies, they're all large cap companies. And they're all S&P 500 constituents. You have the S&P committee that oversees the, you know, the viability of each of the companies before they select them for for inclusion. If you look at the weighted average market cap of the reverse cap weight ETF, the weighted average market cap is 15 billion. So we're talking about companies that are significantly bigger than mid cap companies. But I, I think investors tend to believe that there are three equal buckets. You have large cap, you have mid cap, and you have small cap. And they're all kind of, you know, relatively proportional to each other in terms of their representation. But in reality, what you have is a small cap, where if you look at the market cap weighted, small cap bucket, the weighted average market cap tends to be about $2 billion, depending on the index. And the mid cap tends to be about 5 or $6 billion, depending on the index. And large cap is currently $170 billion weighted average market cap. So you have this huge, huge gap in between, you know, ultra mega cap, which is what people think is a broad large cap index, and then mid cap. So reverse is a tool not only to, to fill that gap and to give investors exposure to, you know, the true large cap, not the mega cap that they're missing out on, but also, like I said, to be used kind of in conjunction with, with the rest of their portfolio to bring that weighted average market cap down to something that's more representative of the U.S. economy. So kind of stemming from what you just said, what are the upsides when when investors get exposures to these uh, cap companies with a kind of more of a stronger growth trajectory? Historically, on an absolute return basis, it does tend to do a little better than market cap weighted, but also with a higher risk, um, slightly higher risk profile. The sharp ratios of of the reverse cap and the equal weighted and the market cap weighted are all pretty close, but the Sortino ratio of reverse cap based on uh, an S&P back test tends to be a little better. The concentration metric that we use, which is the herfindel hirschman index that talks about the diversification of the index, comes out significantly better in the reverse cap version of it. So, you know, it's, it's depending on uh, what uh, an investor is looking for and the makeup of their risk tolerance and their, and their portfolio, we think there's a place here for certain investors. Interesting. So, uh I think you were touching on this a second ago, too, as far as um, kind of where the middle of the pack here is. Um, So I don't want to get uh, forget about those companies that do fall in the middle of the pack. Are there any noticeable trends in relation to growth, uh, industry or risks when we look at the companies who fall into the middle of both the S&P 500 and this kind of upside down fund? Sure. Well, if you think about it as like a seesaw, right? So in the middle, you're going to have as you might expect, based on all the factors, you'd be in the middle in terms of, you know, the, the value versus momentum prism or, or, you know, what have you. There's, there's a great product called the Equal Weight S&P 500, which is, you know, gives you, you know, perfectly even diversified exposure within the S&P 500. As you get into cap weighted, then you get into more of a momentum bias. And as you go to reverse cap, you tend to get into a, a value bias. So it's really, you know, if you think about it, like I said, like, kind of like a seesaw, there's really opposite ends of the spectrum where you're getting with reverse cap those exact factors that you're not getting with market cap weighting that I think a lot of investors aren't aware that they're not getting because they just assume, well, market cap weighting is the way you do it. But if you like equal weighting and you think that that small cap tilt from market cap weighting to equal weighting is beneficial, then reverse gives you more of that. So we saved the best for last. (laughs) This idea of the upside down has permeated, I feel, you know, more than just the investment world, but has come to pop culture as well. So have you watched season two of Stranger Things? So I have not, but I have been subjected to hours of debate about the character development of, who is it, Steve Harrington? Steve Harrington, yes. Yes. Um, My friends Bill and Leah have been going on and on about this, and my hope is that the debate between reverse cap and market cap can only be as engaging as the debate. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Such a good answer. Um, well, Steve Harrington is probably my favorite character coming off of season two. What about Agreed. you, Ryan? Great character development. Great character. Definitely. Great hair. He's had a good progress. 
honestly, <laughs> there's nothing better than his hair. But I think hashtag Steve Harrington deserves I would, better. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree <laughs> that we can have uh, just as ferocious a, of a debate of Team Steve versus Team Nancy as uh, market cap waiting debates can go as well. So. <laughs> All right. Well, Phil, that does it for us. Um, Thank you so much for joining us on the Friday finish line and filling us in on reverse waiting uh, market cap. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again. You're now an official recurring guest and friend of the program. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you very much and and look forward to uh, chatting with you.